Hi there, Chantal here, registered holistic nutritionist from eatheallove.com. Welcome to part four of the six part series on how to reduce inflammation. In this video, I'll be discussing foods that can contribute to inflammation. There are several different diet related causes of inflammation. These are things we want to eat less of, depending on the state of your health, the severity of symptoms, or your sensitivity to these foods. So let's start with processed and refined food. An anti-inflammatory diet is first and foremost a whole foods diet, which means limiting or eliminating any prepackaged foods that contain artificial additives, artificial colors, artificial flavors, and preservatives. Processed foods are not part of an anti-inflammatory whole foods diet which means we want to eat as close to natural as possible. Things like fruit, vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains, and high quality protein. For example, high quality animal protein could mean meat from animals raised without hormones or antibiotics. Pro-inflammatory proteins, on the other hand, would be processed meat products filled with additives and preservatives, like lunch meats or cured meats. This doesn't mean that we can't ever buy food that comes from a box or a package, but we must read the ingredient labels on everything we buy. Even some brands of herbal tea contain artificial flavors and colors. If you're wanting blueberry tea, for example, just make sure that it contains real blueberry and not just a chemical that was designed to taste like blueberry. Like many things in the food industry, there are no regulations when it comes to flavor additives, and the term natural flavors are not that natural at all. Natural flavors can contain emulsifiers, solvents, and preservatives that help separate the natural flavor complex from the original botanical source. Just one natural flavor can contain hundreds of ingredients. To keep things easy, just eat real food. Try preparing a little extra when making meals and freeze them for times when you don't have the time or energy to make full home-cooked meals. Just make sure to follow proper food safety techniques for cooling and reheating foods to avoid the formation of histamine-producing bacteria, which can form when foods are not properly cooled. Histamine stimulates inflammation. Inflammatory conditions have long been thought to be mainly mediated by the activation of histamine receptors. Therefore, following a low histamine diet can be a very important part of following an anti-inflammatory diet. Number two, sugar. Studies show that too much added sugar in the diet is linked to inflammation and that a diet high in added sugar leads to insulin resistance, obesity, increased gut permeability, and low-grade inflammation. One study found that just 30 minutes after consuming a 50-gram dose of fructose caused a spike in inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and revealed that CRP remained high for over two hours. It's important to remember that sugar alone is unlikely to be the singular cause of inflammation. Other factors like stress, smoking, and a lack of sleep, which are some of the things I mentioned in video two of this series, all contribute to inflammation in the body. A diet high in sugar will just compound the problem. Number three, in addition to added sugar, eating too many refined carbohydrates and refined starches like white bread, white pastas, and cereals has also been linked to inflammation. The body breaks down or converts carbohydrates into glucose. But it's important to remember that carbohydrates are not entirely bad. Your body uses the glucose for fuel, but it's important to pick nutrient-rich foods which also contain fiber, which slows down the release of sugars into your bloodstream, and pay attention to your portion sizes. If eating grains, stick to whole grains. Since I'm already on the topic of grains, this is another category that can be problematic for some people. Confusing, right? Because I just told you to eat whole grains, 
But this is why it's so important to take an individualized approach to nutrition, because we're all not going to have the same reactions to food. Many autoimmune protocols embrace the paleo diet, which excludes all grains, not just gluten-containing grains. And there are several arguments to be made for limiting or eliminating grains. Grains, legumes, and nuts and seeds have the highest levels of phytic acid. In excess, phytic acid can block the absorption of minerals like calcium, iron, and zinc. But as long as you're eating a wide variety of different nutrient-rich foods and are mindful about reducing inflammation in the digestive system, having moderate amounts of phytic acid in your diet should be fine. Microbes in our gut actually make phytase, the enzyme that breaks down phytic acid. Lectins are another anti-nutrient found in grains as well as legumes. Lectins are a defense tool for plants, which can irritate the digestive system in some individuals. Those suffering from an autoimmune or inflammatory condition might be dealing with some level of intestinal permeability. It's believed that gluten and other grains and legumes can promote leaky gut. Increased intestinal permeability occurs alongside many diseases, but it's still not clear if it's a symptom or underlying cause of chronic disease. But it does describe a very real and well-studied functional problem in the digestive system. To figure out if you have a sensitivity to grains, try performing a food elimination diet by keeping a food journal of everything you eat and pay close attention to how you feel both physically and mentally after eating. Sometimes a food sensitivity can cause digestive problems, but this is not always the case. If you're eating foods you're sensitive to, they could be causing inflammation, which can cause headaches, joint pain, fatigue, mood swings, or even a flare-up of symptoms from a health condition. Up next, arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid, which is necessary for the repair and growth of skeletal and muscle tissue. Too much omega-6 in the diet, however, stimulates the production of pro-inflammatory prostaglandins and causes the body to over-respond with inflammation during the healing and repair process. When the body is overloaded with arachidonic acid, or omega-6 fatty acids, the inflammatory process is more difficult to halt or reverse. To avoid this imbalance, it's important to have more omega-3 foods in your diet than omega-6 foods. Omega-6 fatty acids are found abundantly in the following foods. Vegetable oil, corn oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, margarine, mayonnaise, organ meats, red meat, and dairy products. Individuals experiencing both acute or chronic inflammation or an active relapse should eliminate these foods to see if they find an improvement in their symptoms. Excess insulin also causes the body to turn omega-6 fats into arachidonic acid, resulting in an inflammatory response which is why it's important to maintain healthy blood sugar levels. Number six, nightshades. Another possible source of inflammation comes from the nightshade family of plants. And while many people have no problems with nightshades, they can cause serious problems for anyone struggling with digestive sensitivities, arthritis, an autoimmune disease, or other inflammatory condition. Foods in this category contain alkaloids that can affect nerve muscle function, joint flexibility, and can contribute to systemic inflammation. Remember, a state of low-grade inflammation can keep the body in a constant state of stress. There are also inflammatory cooking methods to be aware of, but I'll list them as two separate points. The first one involves browning, grilling, and charring. These cooking methods all result in the production of acrylamide. Acrylamide is a chemical that forms when foods are heated to high temperatures. Studies have shown that acrylamide is a cancer-causing and potentially neurotoxic chemical that contributes to oxidative stress and inflammation. 
Levels of acrylamide increase the more cooked and browned the food is. For example, the crust on bread contains acrylamide. Toasted bread contains even more. And burnt toast would contain the highest levels. Other foods that contain acrylamide include potato chips, french fries, sweet potato fries, and baked goods. Studies show that unheated, boiled, or steamed foods show undetectable levels of acrylamide. When cooking starchy root vegetables, it's best to steam or bake them without browning. This not only preserves the nutrient value, but also lessens the formation of acrylamide, which promotes inflammation. This brings me to my next point on inflammatory cooking methods, which is heated oils. The reason why this is inflammatory is because fats and oils are very sensitive to three different factors, heat, oxygen, and light. And so when you fry with any oil, it's exposed to those three factors, and you damage the oils on a molecular level, causing oxidative stress, which leads to the formation of free radicals, which can contribute to inflammation. The most controversial of oils is probably grapeseed oil, since it's actually marketed as an oil suitable for high heat cooking due to its high smoke point. However, the smoking point of an oil does not reflect the stability of the oil. Grapeseed oil might have a high smoke point, but because it's a polyunsaturated oil, it's even more prone to going rancid when heated to any temperature. Eating heated or roasted nuts and seeds or their oils can also contribute to inflammation. It's best to eat nuts and seeds that have not been roasted. I hope you join me in the next video on foods that are known to reduce inflammation. If you want the notes from this entire six-part video series, including a list of both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory foods, plus a list of supplements, check out the link in the description box below. Thank you.